We're going to be in James chapter 2 this morning. If you go ahead and turn in your Bibles to James chapter 2. Uh, while you're doing that, I just want to welcome you here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'd love to meet you after the service. Uh, and if you would do me a favor as well, come over here to Next Steps. We're going to get some stuff in your hand and tell you all about Journey Church. Uh, James is a, a book of action. It's a call for the church not just to be, as we talked about last week, not just to be hearers of the word of God, but also to be doers of the word. We don't want to just sit back and fill ourselves up and then not put our knowledge into action, but we would be a people who hear the word of God and then do the word of God. And it's not based out of religion, because religion is garbage, it is not what we want. It's not out of legalism of doing the right thing because I have to do it, but it's out of this authentic, real, genuine love that we have for the Lord. And so this morning, I really pray that as we go through James chapter 2, that love would be our highest goal, that would come from a place of, man, Lord, I just love you, and Lord, I want to share this love that I have with other people, and that, God, I would be able to genuinely love others. Because we, if we don't understand our love for the Lord and his love for us and be able to receive that, we can't really truly love other people. Perfect love only comes from this perfect father. And so James chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, 13. Let's read this together. It says this. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with what? Partiality. Partiality. For there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say, to him, you sit here in a good place and say, the poor man, you stand over there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? To those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. Forever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point. He is guilty of all for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty for. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Can you say this with me? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Say that one more time. Mercy triumphs over judgment. One more time. Come on, church. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I've entitled my message this morning, Favoritism. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen, and my notes will be sent to you. Uh, through text. Let's pray right now and ask the Lord to speak to us. <sighs> Holy Spirit, we come into this place today with a heart to hear your voice, to have your heart, God, for others. God, I pray that, Lord, you would place inside of your people your perfect love. Because, Lord, perfect love casts out all fear. 
And Lord, when we gave our lives to you, and for those who may not know you, God, I pray they would come to know you. But for those who've given their life to you, God, you are, you are inside of them. And inside of them, God, there is this place where, where we can have your heart for others from a place of perfect love, Father. So, Lord, we ask for you to pour out your perfect love in our lives, Jesus. That, God, for those who we may see disagreements, God, who may see things differently, who may not look like us, think like us, vote like us, that we would be able to extend love and mercy, God, and grace as you have given to us, Jesus. Lord, you are calling your church in this season to be united and united in the faith with this authentic, real love for one another and for this world that your heart breaks for. So God, I ask, Lord, you would give us your heart for your people. Lord, we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said in this place this morning, amen, amen. I uh, want to ask Sarah, I'll ask you a question this morning. Have you, have you ever felt left out before? <laughs> have you ever felt like you, you were passed over? Maybe you didn't get invited to, to the party that you wanted to get invited to. It was a friend's party, and for some reason you were left out. It was obvious that maybe you weren't favored. Maybe you were passed over for a job opportunity that you were the more qualified person, you had pay your dues, so to speak, and then someone else came along and they got the job instead of you and because they were favored. Maybe it all the way goes back to when you were playing basketball at a basketball pickup game and you got picked last or not picked at all. You were passed over. You weren't favored. I think that everyone in this room can say, I've been there. Some of you more so than others, sadly. And what James is saying here in the first 13 verses is that we would extend love and mercy towards others and do so without favoritism. That we wouldn't see other people as that, that don't look like us, think like us, vote like us as them not being favored, but the people who think like us, we favor them that we would show love and mercy to everyone as Christ has shown love and mercy. But what I'm not talking about this morning is this, and I don't want to fall into this trap, and I don't want to get political this morning either, by no means, but uh, I think that the heart behind what James is speaking is a heart of unity and love for everyone. But what I'm not saying this morning is I'm not condoning sin, okay? I'm not condoning homosexuality because God made them male and female. I'm not condoning cohabiting together. I'm not condoning the sin of covetedness, pride, lust, envy. I'm not condoning sin. I'm not saying that us as Christians should back down and have no backbone and stand up for what is right because I believe that there comes a time and a season where the body of Christ has to stand up for what is right. I'm not saying that this morning as we're going into the word of God. We've got to firmly stand in these last days for what we believe and what we know, what the word of God is speaking and what the word of God is saying. And he's calling his church to take a stand. He's calling us to take a stand no matter how much it makes us feel uncomfortable. No matter how much it makes us feel like, man, I don't know if I'm stepping on toes right now. But we've got to do so with love and mercy and with grace, okay? A lot of times what happens when we try to take a stand, we do so with a heart of I'm right and they're wrong. (laughs) And it's not received with love. What I'm saying here this morning is this, that James' heart, I believe, in these 13 verses is that we would not show favoritism towards other people, that we would love our neighbors as ourselves, that we would extend the same mercy and love that God has extended to us. And so this morning, I want to give you three things uh, that we can learn and reflect on from these 13 verses in James chapter 2. The first thing that I want to give you this morning is this, 
Don't play favorites. Don't play favorites. This is a call to honor one another. James starts off with a very direct statement in verse 1. He says this, my brethren, do not hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with what? Partiality. Partiality. It is a command, not a suggestion. The word James uses here for partiality, which is uh, from the Greek, it literally means this. It It means to receive the face. To receive the face. This is literal meaning. Which that means to judge someone based on their outward appearance, status, or wealth. But we all know this, that we all know that favoritism, sometimes it goes much deeper than outward appearance. Sometimes favoritism goes all the way to the extent of our opinions about things and our beliefs about things. Showing favoritism is something that we have all been guilty of. Every single person in this room has been guilty of it at some point in their life. It's easy to show preference to people who think like us, look like us, and vote like us. And James gives us a very practical example here in verse 2. It says this, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come and a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You sit there or sit here at my footstool. What James is saying here is this. Let me just kind of give you a summary. Is that two people walk into a church and one person, man, they look the part and uh, they they, they look like they've got everything put together. Another person comes into the church and, well, they don't really look that way. And so you show favor. Maybe you greet that person and say, hey, man, you can sit over here. Sit with me because that person looks the part. And the person that doesn't look the part, you just kind of don't even talk to and reject. I want to give you some very practical advice because I believe in this room that Journey Church, man, we are not that way at all. We love and love really, really well everyone. And that's a representation of the body of Christ. It is beautiful and wonderful. But I think some practical application for us is this. You know, we've, um, all glory to God for this, we've had over 100 people visit here at Journey in the past six weeks or so. Absolutely incredible. You can see God's favor on it, over 100 people. But I I know this about those 100 people who have come to visit, that, man, I can't reach out to them, all of them, and make them feel a part of our family and our community. I can't do that on my own. I know this as well. Our staff, even myself and our staff, we can't do that as as a whole either. Like, we need everyone who calls Journey Church their family to also... Not show favors for the people that you know, but then to look outside for that new person who's coming in, who may be coming to church for the first time in their entire lives. I mean, think about it. People come into these doors, and they may not have been to church. They don't know what this thing is all about, and they're just saying, man, I need something, and I'm desperate because I've been going through this hard, difficult situation, and I, I, I need something. So they're looking for something. They don't even know what they're looking for, but what they're looking for is a family that loves them in the love of God. And we as a community, if you call Journey your home, we as a community get to do that together. It's not just my calling, it is also your calling. This is is my calling, this is our staff's calling, is to equip uh, people for the work of the ministry. You may look at me and say, man, Adam, you're you're the minister. No, yes, I I am, but my calling is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. It's not all on me, it's us as a family and as a body of Christ. Because that person who comes through these doors who may have come never to church before or maybe they went to church as a kid and now uh, they're coming back to the Lord because they feel something inside their heart that is drawing them back. And they've probably been through a difficult moment or maybe they just started having kids and it's like, okay, we've got to get this thing right now, right? Or maybe for them they're coming from a place where they've experienced some hurt and some pain in another church and... They're coming, man, I just want some healing right now. Or maybe they're just coming because someone invited them too. Maybe we can do that. But what we're called to do as a family is to love those who are new. Not to show favoritism to the people that we see week in and week out all the time. I want to challenge you, if you call Journey your family, 
challenge you to do this. Find one person every single week that you may not know, that you've never talked to in your entire life, and just extend love to them. Invite them to coffee maybe once a month or something else like that, and just get together with them and hang out with them and show them the love of Jesus, that they would feel like, man, I can come and be a part of this family and this beautiful family because, man, we are a diverse church and everyone here can feel welcome. When we ignore someone who might seem less important, James calls that a sin. When we ignore someone who seems less important, James is calling that a sin. Look at verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I'm going to read that again, let it sink in. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? God does not judge us based on our external appearances, thank God, because I'm losing my hair. Praise Jesus. Help me. Wish my wife would just let me shave it sometimes. <laughs> Man, I'm going off on a tangent. Lord, help me. I'm thankful that what he does, he looks at our heart, right? He looks at our heart. And if we're going to reflect God's character, we need to see people the way God sees people. May we see people the way the Lord sees people. This is actually one of our values here at Journey. I want to read this to you. You can find it on the wall out there in the hallway. Edification, speak life. We see people the way God sees people. We call out destiny and others by speaking life and not death. Receive that this morning. We see people the way God sees people. This is for us as a family, us as a church. We call out destiny and others by speaking life and not death. Every person in this room, I want to encourage you for a moment. You have a calling on your life. And every single role in which you play is important. God has given you gifts. He has given you talents. He has placed upon you things that you see and that you're good at that I'm not good at at all. And that other people in this room are. We need you to fulfill your destiny and walk in the calling in which God has placed on your life. Now, the beautiful thing about this, and we shouldn't allow this to happen, is you are called to greatness. But it's when you humble yourself before God and you allow him to work through you. And so in me telling you this, don't try to do it on your own. Go low. Walk in humility and in the love of the Lord. And then from that place, God through his spirit empowers you with his grace to then for you to walk in the destiny and the calling upon your life. Because you are a child of God. And he has called you. He has set you apart. He has put you here for such a time as this to do the work of the ministry. And you're not anything special because when you look at other people, they are called to the exact same thing. And my role here at Journey is not any more important than your role. It's not. We like to say around here that it's from the parking lot to the pulpit, every role is different, but every role is important. You're called to do the work of the ministry. And also knowing this, that you are a child of the Most High God. You being a child of the Most High God means that that person sitting next to you and that person who's offended you is also a child of the Most High God. And so... If they're also a child of the Most High God and God has extended his love, mercy, and grace towards you, you then are able to extend mercy and love and grace towards the one who may have offended you. Amen. That you would begin to see them as a child of God. That they also have a destiny and a purpose upon their life. What often happens when someone does something to you and you're, you're offended is you begin to pray for them in a way of, Pray against them almost. It goes like this, like, Lord, would you open their, your, their eyes so that they might see how they have done me wrong? That is not the prayer that you pray. What ends up happening is this root of bitterness gets down inside of you. This is how you pray for them. Lord, would you bless them? God, I pray you'd bless their family. God, I, bre I pray you'd bless their job. God, I pray you'd pour out your spirit upon them and their house, God. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would do a work in them. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would know you in a way they've never known you before. And what ends up happening as you pray for God to bless them, before you know it, 
that thing of offense in your life is suddenly just gone. You don't even think about it anymore. That we wouldn't show favoritism, that we would extend love, mercy, and grace the way God has extended his love and his mercy and grace upon us. So a very practical application this morning. Who are you judging? Who are you judging? I think every single person in this room might have someone that immediately comes to their mind. Who are you judging? Ask God to help you see them the way he sees them. As a child of God who has a purpose and a destiny upon their life. And then pray for them in a healthy way. Or would you bless them and keep them and make their face, make your face shine upon them and give them peace? The second thing we can learn from James chapter 2 is this. Favoritism breeds a religious spirit. Favoritism breeds a religious spirit. Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, royal law James puts it this way, and I love it because royal law is going back to him recognizing Jesus, God, as Lord and King, that he is supreme. And so he's saying, this is the royal law given to me, given to us by God, and he is Lord of lords and King of kings. How many of you just want to say, God, you are Lord of lords and King of kings in my life? So when we come to that place and we recognize that, it empowers us then to do this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, we, li we live in a time, I believe, where loving each other in the body of Christ is incredibly misunderstood. I really believe that. We live in a time where many people have built entire so-called ministries, especially on YouTube, around criticizing other ministries and leaders, and that's all they do where they focus more on proving others wrong than they actually do on teaching the word of God. These type of ministries thrive on conflict, on picking apart every doctrinal difference, and they often disguise their pride as zeal for God's word. But the truth is this. They're really showing favoritism to those who agree with them and condemning those who don't. Because they're blind by their own pride and their need to be right. I want to give you a warning if you're listening to ministries like that. Run. Run as fast as you possibly can. That ministry is built around pride. It's built by their need to be right and to prove other people wrong. Run, run as fast as you possibly can because what that's doing in your own life is it's breeding legalism and a religious spirit. And run. Verse nine, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. If you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. When you treat people who don't think like you, look like you, vote like you differently, James says it's a sin. It's a sin. It's an easy trap for us to fall into. <laughs> Thinking, I'm right, they're wrong, so I'm going to distance myself from them. And that's not the way of Jesus, church. It's not the way of Jesus. A religious spirit creeps in when we care more about being right than about loving others. We show favor towards those who share our opinions and condemn others for holding different opinions. We are operating in pride and not in love, church. A religious spirit divides the body of Christ, but the Holy Spirit unifies us because then we have the fruit of the Spirit operating in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May God give you self-control. May God give you self-control to truly share the love of Christ with others. Not to condemn others who don't think like you, look like you, or vote like you. Show the love of Jesus. Show the love of Jesus. May we have a heart to show the love of Jesus to a world that is lost and hurting, 
to a world that is far from God. This past uh, week, uh, we were having some family devotions and um, asking the kids, you know, what do you want to read tonight? And they said, let's read a story uh, in the Old Testament. So we began to read a story of Jonah. And I'd forgotten a little bit about the last chapter, chapter 4, and Jonah's really his true heart. <laughs> uh, we actually read all four chapters because the kids didn't want to stop. And as we read it, you know, of course I remember how Jonah was called to go to Nineveh to see the people repent and turn from their ways. But what Jonah did was he, what did he do? He, he ran from the calling of God on his life. Why though? I would submit to you because he didn't like the other people. And so he ran when God empowered him and told him to go to Nineveh to deliver this message so that then they would be saved. So he ran, we know the story, he got swallowed up by this fish, unbelievable, blows my mind. Then he goes and he delivers the message which God gave him because, well, he's in a humbled by, he's going in, <laughs> in this fish. And um, so he goes and delivers this message. The, the people there, they repent. They fast and they repent and they turn to God. Jonah, though, he goes, stands outside the city and he's warning the people to be taken out by God. I don't really understand the story that kind of leaves you on a cliffhanger, but Jonah's, Jonah's heart was not really for the people. Did God use him regardless? Yes, he did. But we don't hear anything more about Jonah. Paul, on the other hand, he was a Jew that had a true heart for Gentiles. His heart broke for what broke the heart of God. He truly loved the Gentiles. He wanted to see them saved. He wanted to see them set free. He wanted to see them encounter the living presence of God. And he, he writes this. This is really... Beautiful the way Paul really does love the people who are not like him. He's in a Roman jail cell uh, for his faith and about to be killed for his faith. And he writes this to the church of Ephesus, these Gentiles. And I want you, as we read this, I want you to notice his real love for them. His love for them to know Christ. Not out of obligation, not out of legalism, but his heart to really, really, truly love them. Look at verse 11, Ephesians 2. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. How many of you know, man, we are in a world that has no hope without God? But now in Christ Jesus, you once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Aren't you thankful for that wall being broken down? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law and commands con uh, contained in ordinances so as to create in, in himself one new man from two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to, to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. This is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. Paul's heart posture towards the Gentiles. 
This man was willing to risk his life to be with people and minister to people that didn't look like him, think like him, or vote like him. He was willing to love and minister to people on the other side so they can encounter the very living presence of God. His boldness was uncompromising passion to the Gentiles that was wild and outrageous and didn't make sense. They were trying to kill him. Meanwhile, he was trying to minister to them and reconcile them back to God. Beautiful, his heart. Imagine one day you're in line with Paul. He's right in front of you. You're about to be judged by the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We're all going to be there one day. And just imagine Paul saying to you, What did you do for Jesus? And you look at him and you say, Well, um, I went to church on Sunday. And he's like, hey, what else did you do? Well, I had Bible studies here and there, and I went to church and uh, did some worship. And he's like, no, what, what did you do? Well, that one time I was really scared and I shared my faith, but then, you know, I didn't really do it anymore. Oh, so, so, so one? And then he's like, no, what did you do? And your response is, well, they didn't think like me. They didn't agree with me on things. <laughs> and Paul looks at you and says, wow. I don't know about you, but that's a scary, scary thing. That you may get to heaven, but then everything that you've done is just enough to get there, and that's it. May we have a heart like Paul to go to people who don't think like us, look like us, or vote like us. May, and I say vote because this is a season. I'm just going to preface this. You might be saying, Adam, you're getting a little political. I'm really not because we're in a season right now where the body of Christ likes to attack other people based upon opinions and thought processes. Are we supposed to vote policies? Absolutely. I would submit that to you. But let's not be a people who are trying to divide one another because of our thought processes and our differences and opinions. That is the enemy. That's what Satan comes to do. Can we be a people who guard our hearts? I'm telling you right now, Facebook is not a, not a playground for us to go and to put our opinions and thoughts processes on. Facebook is the devil, y'all. <laughs> Are we to stand up for what is right? Absolutely. Again, I'm not saying that. Man, guard your heart in this season. Guard your thought process. Put your heart on the Lord. Have have a view of, man, I want to pray for people. I want to pray for my country. And I want to love people just really, really well. Because listen, the only thing that is going to change someone's heart is for them to know the love of God through you. You're not going to win a debate. I don't care how smart you are. I really don't. You're not going to win a debate. Has anybody ever won a debate in here? I mean, I, 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 I've rarely won a debate in my life. And I would consider myself uh, not, not the top echelon, but I'm all right. I'm just saying, man, like, they're going to know us by our love. They're going to know us by our desire to bring unity, our desire to bring unity within the body of Christ. Our desire to extend mercy and grace and love as God has given us. This world does not need to be intellectually convinced about the Lord. What they need is they need an encounter with the Holy Spirit. They need an encounter with the living King, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And we can't do that if we try to convince them and try to divide in that way. I I was debating whether to share this. It popped in my head this morning. Um, I want to get real talk for just a moment. So last night uh, when, we, when we left and the Lord just showed up in a really, really powerful way, um, stopped to get, get food for my kids and for myself. Man, I was super, super hungry. I don't know about you guys. And uh, I, uh, while we were sitting there at Toonies, I was getting them a, a hamburger down on Blanding. And uh, um, my son, he asked me a question, and it kind of came out of nowhere. I was kind of surprised by it. He said, Dad, do you ever doubt God? 
And I was like, Caleb, that is a really great question. <laughs> and man, I am so glad that you had the boldness to ask me. Because here's the thing about this, is that I don't need my kids to believe in God because of me. <laughs> and I asked him the next question. I said, son, have you ever just felt the Holy Spirit come over you? And as you're worshiping the Lord, as you're reading his word, you feel like he's speaking to you. And he goes, yeah, I've definitely felt that, dad. And I said to him, man, I have too on so, so many occasions. And he goes, but sometimes I still think about it. And I said, man, Caleb, that is okay. That is absolutely okay. And I said to him, listen, I have a history with the Lord now. I've followed the Lord since I was, you know, honestly, since I was five years old. And were there times, though, when I was 16, 17, 18, even in my adulthood, where I thought, is God real? Yeah, I did. But then I would immediately remind myself of my history with the Lord. I would immediately remind myself, man, I know what God spoke to me here. I know when I read the word, I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me. I know when I worshiped, I know that, man, all of a sudden the Lord showed up and he came and I encountered the Holy Spirit and I knew in that moment without a doubt that he was real. I go back and I remember the history of the Lord where I saw miracles happen, where I went on a missions trip and I saw someone immediately healed. I remember when I saw someone who was literally demon-possessed in Nicaragua and the God just setting them free just like that. I would go back and I would remember how the Lord uh, would give me a word and then come to find out, man, that word was actually fulfilled. And there's no way humanly possible that anybody else could give that word ahead of time. And I would say to him, listen, son, you've got to develop your own history with God. And it's okay to have doubt, but as you press into the Lord, and as you create this history with the Lord, you're going to come to a place where there is no doubt in your mind anymore. Like in my life, I have no doubt about God because I have a history with him. And I said to my son, I said to him, Caleb, you've got to develop a history with God. And it is healthy and it's okay to have those questions. In this world, I'm telling you, they're trying to be convinced. But the only thing that's really going to convince them is, man, is this coming to, to Jesus moment where they have this encounter with the living presence of the almighty God. It's not going to happen through a debate, y'all. To know the Lord in this, un, this moment of just no doubt that God is here and have experienced the Lord. Jonah didn't want to forgive Nineveh because he didn't like him. Paul, with the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't care how he was perceived by the religious people, by the Pharisees. He just wanted to go and to love others and bring unity to the body of Christ. Here's the third thing we can learn from James chapter 2. Unity over agreement. Unity over agreement. There's power in a diverse church that is unified. There's a power in a diverse church that is unified. Verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. This is powerful. James is reminding us that when we stand before God and are judged, he's not going to ask about our doctrinal beliefs and whether or not we got them all right. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't got them all right. You don't got them all right. He's not going to ask us, did we vote Democrat or Republican? He's not. What is he going to ask us, how did you love? How did you love? Did you love me and did you love others? How did you love? What I believe God wants to do within our church and the greater sea church is he wants to multiply his church in these last days. He wants to take the fish and the loaves just as that boy presented to Jesus. 
and multiply them. You see, he looked at the crowd. He had compassion. And his heart broke for the crowd first. And then he took the fish and the loaves. The disciples were saying, maybe they should go back and find some food. They're hungry, Lord. Jesus said, I'm going to take this. When you, he's giving me this boy is surrendering over to me. May we have childlike faith, church, and surrender it over to God and allow God to multiply things. It's not going to be out of our own ability, out of our own mind, out of our own strength, out of our own power. It's going to be when we surrender what we have given to over to God, and then he brings the multiplication. That's how multiplication happens. And so what we are saying here at Journey is, Lord, here's what we got. It's not much. But, Lord, would you multiply it? Would you multiply it? Would you take it and would you multiply it? The enemy comes to divide. What's the opposite of multiplication? Division. The enemy wants to divide his church. He wants to divide the greater sea church and us get hung up over all these different beliefs and thought processes when God's like, listen, come together. Come together. Be unified. Listen, you don't have to, I'm just going to say this. You don't have to agree with me on every single doctrinal issue. Because if that was the case, Laura and I couldn't attend the same church. It's the truth. We think differently. Our family thinks differently. But what's beautiful is when we don't agree, but then we come together and we say, Lord, let's keep the main thing the main thing. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that this world is hurting and broken, and we need to give our encounters with the Lord away. For freely we've received, now freely we're going to give. We're going to give what the Lord has shown us. We're going to give it away to a lost and a hurting world. In Acts chapter 2, I love Acts chapter 2 and how the Holy Spirit poured out in that upper room and everyone encountered the Spirit of God and what happened on that day, multiplication happened. 3,000 people came to the faith. But what started it? What started it? They all came together in one accord. When they came together in one accord and with unity, then the Holy Spirit came. We think that the Holy Spirit comes and brings unity, but no, God's looking for a church who is unified and then he pours out his spirit. He pours out his spirit. And so what we are doing is we're coming together in unity and with love with one another. And then from that place, God pours out his spirit. So how do we do that? We show love to one another. We extend grace and mercy to one another. And as we extend the same grace and mercy that we've been given to one another, God then unifies us. As we're unified and then pours out his spirit, and then we're able to see a church moving in the direction that God wants us to move in. And I believe that what the Lord is doing right now is he's stirring up his greater seed church, churches from all around to understand this, that we're not trying to uh, be hung up over stuff and divided, that we can have different denominations and backgrounds, but we can all come together and just say, man, Lord, we want to see this world changed and saved and healed by the power of your spirit.